According to the theory of panspermia, life could have been brought to Earth by a meteorite, comet, or asteroid from a different region of space. At the moment, this idea remains purely theoretical. But let's figure out if it could actually turn out to be true. Traditionally, exobiologists, those who are focused on searching for life outside Earth, have been trying to explore the possibility of life on Mars or in the subsurface oceans of Saturn's and Jupiter's icy moons. But simple life could be much more widespread. It could be drifting through interplanetary space right now, in the form of dormant bacteria and spores. Several scientists have noted that the ultra-harsh environment of space is likely to severely damage the DNA and RNA of such spores and microorganisms. Others believe that since enough microbes could be traveling in a dust cloud, some of them could survive in their original form. There are several types of panspermia. For example, lithopanspermia proposes that some kind of microbic life could exist in debris blasted into the cosmos after planetary collisions with comets and asteroids. Radiopanspermia claims that organisms might be able to travel through space with the help of radiation coming from stars. But in this case, it's unclear how the effect of dangerous ultraviolet and X-ray radiation combined with the vacuum of space doesn't totally destroy microorganisms. There's also pseudopanspermia. According to it, organic building blocks of life appear in interstellar clouds of dust. They get transported to the surfaces of planets, and life starts developing there. It sounds really fascinating, but is there any evidence for the panspermia theory? Well, there have been a few orbital experiments. For example, from 2008 to 2016, the samples gathered by EXPOSE, special equipment mounted outside the International Space Station and dedicated to astrobiology, were exposed to the conditions of space. After that, they were returned to Earth from the ISS. It turned out that some of them had survived those severe conditions. There was even a case when 100% of bacterial spores placed in Mars-like conditions were still capable of life. Also, some seeds survived and were later grown as plants on Earth. There have also been exostack experiments on the U.S. Long Duration Exposure Facility satellite and biopan experiments on Russian photon capsules. They have shown that with minimal protection, spores, lichens, and even minuscule animals, such as tardigrades, might be able to survive in space for as long as several years. A piece of Surveyor 3 lunar lander was brought back to Earth in 1969 by the Apollo 12 mission. Shockingly, it contained an Earth bacterium that had survived unprotected for more than two years on the airless surface. At the same time, this bacterium could have come from laboratory contamination on arrival back on Earth. The Indian Space Research Organization carried out a search for space microorganisms too. It was done at stratospheric altitudes via balloon flights. The results showed that living interplanetary cells existed in air samples taken from heights of above 25 miles. Normally, air from lower levels of the atmosphere can't be transported there, so this discovery seemed to prove the theory of panspermia. But in 2010, NASA atmospheric sampling before and after hurricanes proved that under certain circumstances, Earth bacteria could actually be transported very high into the upper levels of the atmosphere. One of the main arguments against panspermia is that if this theory was correct, all life found throughout the solar system would have a common origin and share main biochemical characteristics like genetic code. It doesn't sound plausible. Many specialists believe that only the presence of astronaut explorers on the surfaces of, let's say, Mars, Europa, or Enceladus can properly solve the question of life in the solar system. They can compare any life forms found with Earth-type life, which can turn out to be a real test of panspermia. In any case, until probes finally find direct proof of space-borne life, the panspermia theory will remain unproven. There are probably 36 other civilizations hanging out in the Milky Way, and over 170 billion galaxies, give or take, in the observable universe. Conditions for life are all over space. So, where is everybody? Nuclear physicist Enrico Fermi came up with this exact same question during a lunch break with his colleagues in 1950. 
leading to one of the most unsettling paradoxes in the universe. Even though there's a huge probability of extraterrestrial civilizations existing, we still haven't found any clear evidence of them. One possible explanation comes from the zoo hypothesis. It suggests that advanced extraterrestrial societies exist and know exactly who we are and where we are, but intentionally choose to stay hidden. They're just observing human quirky behaviors, as if we're in some kind of a cosmic wildlife park. But their intentions could be much darker. If you're a Star Trek fan, you probably remember the main rule for Federation members. Starfleet officers shouldn't contact species that are not advanced to avoid messing with their development, even if it means risking their own lives. Now, even though it's fiction, this rule perfectly captures what the zoo hypothesis is all about. Beings from other corners of the universe see our planet as a cosmic zoo with one-way bars. They can watch us brushing our teeth in the morning or walking our dog, but we can't catch a glimpse of them. In this theory, non-terrestrial life forms deliberately keep their distance from us, sticking to a hands-off policy agreement in the vast cosmic neighborhood. It's like those super smart beings agreed that we needed to have the freedom to shape our own future and destiny, following our own path of development without external contamination. The idea is that these super advanced civilizations could be like, oh, I don't know, 500 million years ahead of us, which would explain why we haven't seen any signs of them. And maybe it's better this way, as humans could eventually be destroyed or even assimilated by this new cosmic power, Independence Day style. As much as things like going to an art museum might be interesting to us, extraterrestrials probably wouldn't be too thrilled watching us stare at the Mona Lisa painting for hours. Interplanetary cultures might be more into buying tickets to quietly observe how we're developing new technologies, such as ultra-modern satellites. According to the zoo theory, they can't reach out to us until we hit a certain level of development. So improving our technology and wisdom could be the only way to show them that we're mature enough and don't need their spaceship parenting anymore. There are a couple of reasons why it's hard to buy into the zoo hypothesis. I mean, okay, extraterrestrials might not visit or reach out because we're not all that advanced. But it is tough to explain why they keep ignoring all our attempts to communicate. Even if the zookeepers try their best not to interfere with animals' lives and behaviors. I bet they couldn't just ignore a bear speaking in loud and clear English about its desire to communicate. So that's pretty much why humans keep trying and trying to provoke some reaction from inhabitants of other planets using radio signals. In 2017, in a valley 8 miles southeast of the Norwegian city of Tromsø, a radar antenna transmitted some specially composed electronic music to potential intergalactic listeners. The target audience was in GJ273, also known as Light and Star. It's a runty red dwarf located 12 light years from our solar system. Since radio waves travel at the speed of light, we'll have to wait more than two decades before looking for a reply. But the main problem with radio waves is that we're kind of in the dark about where to look and civilizations might be as far as 17,000 light years away. Plus, we don't know which radio frequency extraterrestrials use to chat. Now here on Earth, we use the radio spectrum to send signals into the universe, assuming that what works for us might be a common method for other civilizations. But in fact, it could be considered a somewhat old-school technique for other beings. That's why current projects are now looking for techno-signatures, which are signs of technological activity from extraterrestrials, like city lights, solar panels, megastructures, or artificial satellites. Another potential clue is to study the atmospheres of planets orbiting nearby stars, as an advanced civilization might be altering its atmosphere with different gases, making it detectable. Despite decades of observations, there is still no definitive evidence that advanced extraterrestrial civilizations are out there. But that doesn't mean they don't exist. 
Even by expanding search fields, we're talking about odds much slimmer than hitting the jackpot, with a roughly 1 in 3 billion chance of finding an advanced civilization within a given distance from Earth. Maybe space creatures are responding to our communication attempts, but in a way that we can't understand. The universe has been around for more than 13 billion years, while humans showed up just 200,000 years ago. And this is about 0.01% of the universe's age. It's like we're still learning to talk. While other super smart beings might be sending us messages that are all lost in translation. We keep waiting for a giant UFO to land on Earth and for green ETs with huge eyes to come out of it. But we forget that our intergalactic neighbors could be more interesting in building nanotechnologies to watch over us. They could also be trying to communicate using neutrinos, which are subatomic particles with an extremely small mass that could effortlessly pass through our planet without being detected by our current technological devices. Now, the zoo hypothesis has another issue. It is pretty tough to believe that, with all these civilizations supposedly hanging out in the universe, they would all decide not to reach out to humans. For this to happen, there would have to be a great sense of structure, with a higher intelligence working as the head of the universe, giving them direct orders and clear rules to keep us isolated. But we're talking about billions of possibilities for life, right? More civilizations mean that there are more chances of a violation of this no-contact rule. So, most likely, at least one independent planet would be just as desperate to find life in the universe as we are. Some scientists also believe that if such advanced life had substantially colonized Earth and many other planets, we would know it by now. The zoo hypothesis has two other variations that are even more frightening. In the laboratory hypothesis, nobody contacts us because humankind is actually being subjected to experiments, and Earth is essentially a giant science lab. Otherworldly creatures could be analyzing human responses to various survival challenges, such as tsunamis or massive earthquakes. In this case, the no-contact agreement between all other space groups would make a bit more sense since it's in the name of scientific research for the greater good. At least for them. The planetarium hypothesis, proposed in 2001, suggests that we are living in an artificial universe, in some kind of virtual reality designed to give us the illusion that the universe is empty when it's not. But no possible generator could test this hypothesis. Besides the zoo, the laboratory, and the planetarium theories, there is another possible answer to the Fermi paradox. Nobody contacts us because humans are completely alone in the universe. This is known as the rare Earth hypothesis, and it emphasizes how Earth occupies an incredibly unique position. No other planet could bring life to the universe that could be more than just bacteria. We may consider ourselves pretty lucky as even a small change in any of Earth's orbital parameters, like the distance from the Earth to the Sun or the rate of rotation, could make conditions too extreme for people or life in general. But again, it's hard to think that we are alone in this vast universe. So, we're back to the paradox. Where is everybody? Without knowing languages, people from different countries won't be able to communicate with one another efficiently. And imagine if some extraterrestrial civilization sent a message to Earth. How would we figure out their intentions? Like, do they want to get to know us better? Or is it a warning about a full-scale intrusion? It must be terribly hard to bridge the gap between us and creatures whose minds, bodies, and habitats are totally different from ours. So, to practice decoding potential extraterrestrial messages, an artist-led group created a mock message from stars. It was the most alien missive the world had ever seen. Even though it was written for humans by humans, it was as non-human as possible. The message was sent from Mars to Earth, and three observatories detected the transmission 16 minutes later. Unfortunately, so far, no one has deciphered the message, but many have been trying to do it. There are only three people in the world who know what the message means, one of them is the project's founder, Daniela DePaulis. 
She and two other co-authors created the message after consulting with scientists, poets, programmers, and philosophers from all over the world. The main challenge for them was to get rid of anthropocentricity to make the message as realistically alien as possible. So the team immediately ruled out any kind of language-based communication. Even though now, they refuse to confirm or deny that the message contains text. The creators were also considering using mathematics. Yes, the fundamental concepts of this science are universal, but different cultures may represent math differently. DePaulis and her team struggled to compose the message for years, experiencing massive writer's block. But eventually, in 2019, the idea was formed. Three years later, in 2022, a major breakthrough occurred when the team drew inspiration from a short story called A Sing in Space. And a month before the transmission, an astronomer joined the team, adding a mathematical touch to the message to make it more universal. Since the first announcement, the project has attracted loads of puzzle lovers. They started to exchange ideas, hoping to solve the mystery. Some of them were among the first people to extract the raw message from the ExoMars orbiter's broadcast. It was a 40 gigabyte string of numbers interwoven with the alien message. If it had been real, it would have arrived unannounced, of course. But in this case, the signal came at a precisely scheduled time. Now imagine peeling layers off an onion. That's what filtering the data segment looked like. But after a week's effort, the enthusiasts received an image of five speckled clusters against a blank background. After that, the speculation on the meaning of this picture started. Could the message be hinting at the alien's appearance? Was it Morse code? Maybe it hid some genetic secrets? One user even enlisted ChatGPT to help decipher the message. There was also a theory that the image was a star map with the location of the alien civilization. Another suggested that the dots resembling constellations could be molecules. Probably, they were part of the biosignature of the foreign world. But decryption is the process of making sense of some message for which only the intended recipient has a key. That's why this kind of code breaking is much more difficult than decoding, because you need to guess the missing key. Another tricky part is where to start. Every attempt feels like a stab in the dark. You might believe that you have started to see patterns, but you need to stop and think whether it's true or you're just projecting. The community is still trying to decode the message. At the moment, there are more than 30 ideas for how to do it. Only after that can people try to understand its full meaning. How about you? Would you like to try and take part in the process? Maybe you've got some idea? Then share them with us. How about I tell you that aliens might exist? I know it probably goes against everything you believe in, but it's a new model of the universe that could explain how intelligent life spreads and distributes. This model makes lots of predictions. For example, we should expect to meet another civilization at some point. It also mentions our chances of starting to get messages from aliens, or even becoming an interplanetary civilization ourselves. This model also explains why we haven't met other space civilizations yet, considering the huge number of stars and galaxies in the universe. But let's go into detail. The main assumption of the model is that, at one point, a civilization existing in the vastness of the cosmos can become... grabby. You see, there are two types of civilizations. Quiet aliens don't actually try to expand. Neither do they change much. After some time, they just disappear. That might be the reason why we don't have any data about them. And all that is left to do is to make speculations about their existence. But there are also loud aliens. They supposedly keep spreading really fast until they meet other space civilizations. The model also calls these loud aliens grabby. That's because they expand from their home planet at a fraction of the speed of light. They also make significant and visible changes wherever they travel. And they last for a really long time, too. Why might we suppose that grabby aliens exist? Because their existence may be the most plausible explanation for why humanity appeared so early in the history of the universe. See for yourself. The current date is 13.8 billion years after the Big Bang. Small stars can burn their cosmic fuel for up to a trillion years. According to the standard model of the origin of advanced life, 
It's more likely to appear at the end of the longest planet lifetimes. Well, grabby aliens might be to blame for our early appearance. Such civilizations could set deadlines for others. If such aliens indeed exist, they will occupy most of the observable universe really soon. And when they succeed, no other civilizations will be able to appear, because all the habitable planets will already be taken. A civilization like ours, advanced but not grabby yet, could only appear early, because later it wouldn't have a chance to do it. There's another reason why the idea of grabby aliens seems plausible. Look at life on Earth, like humans. Aren't we grabby in many ways, too? Species, cultures, and companies tend to expand and occupy new niches and territories as fast as they can. For example, species spreading on new territories get access to new resources, and thus increase their population. Why shouldn't we expect the same behavior from extraterrestrial civilizations? The main author of this model, Robin Hansen, was also the first to introduce the idea of the Great Filter in 1996. According to the Great Filter theory, the universe is filled with countless life forms. But people haven't stumbled across any of them yet, because somewhere, there is a Great Filter. The main purpose of this filter is to stop and finish those civilizations that advance to the level of star colonization. Suppose that this idea is true. There are three possible scenarios for our civilization. The first one. We're unique because we have passed the Great Filter. Other civilizations haven't managed to make it this far. The second scenario goes like this. We're among the first potential colonizers. Before the conditions in space were too harsh for life forms to leave their home planets. In this case, chances are high that we'll soon encounter other civilizations. And the third scenario is quite worrying. We haven't reached the level of technological development that is advanced enough for the filter to locate us. This means that we haven't passed the filter yet. In other words, the trial is still ahead, and it's a big question if we manage to pass it. Throughout the years, scientists have made some discoveries that seem to hint at the existence of extraterrestrial life. But do they really? Let's find out. In 1976, NASA's Viking Mars landers detected chemical signatures that could be a sign of extraterrestrial life. During one of the experiments, Martian soil was mixed with special nutrients and then tested for the production of methane gas, and the test's result was positive. In other words, something in the soil was metabolizing these nutrients and producing the gas. Unfortunately, other experiments conducted on board the landers didn't show any evidence of life. It caused NASA to declare the result a false positive. And still, some scientists keep standing by the finding, arguing that the experiments on board were ill-equipped to look for a key indicator of life, organic molecules. In 1977, an Ohio State University radio telescope detected a bizarre pulse of radiation coming from someplace near the Sagittarius constellation. It lasted 37 seconds and was so unexpected that the astronomer who was monitoring the data at that moment scribbled, wow, on the telescope's printout. The thing is that the radio frequency of the signal is internationally banned on Earth. The signal could be the result of a supermassive astronomical event, or it could be sent by some kind of intelligent life with immensely powerful transmitters. So far, this mystery has remained unexplained. In 1996, NASA scientists announced that they had found something that could be microbes in a potato-shaped chunk of Martian rock. The meteorite might have been blasted off the surface of Mars in a collision. It had been wandering the solar system for about 15 million years before it fell in Antarctica. Analyses showed that the meteorite contained some organic molecules and tiny particles of the mineral called magnetite. It's sometimes found in bacteria living on our planet. NASA researchers used an electron microscope and announced that they had spotted nanobacteria. But since that time, this evidence has been called into question a few times. Some experts say that the particles of magnitude are not really similar to those found on our planet. And Earth's contaminants are likely to be the source of organic molecules. Jupiter's moon Europa has a bizarre red tinge. Some of the theories explaining this phenomenon 
have suggested the reason is frozen bits of bacteria, which are also responsible for the mysterious infrared signal the moon gives off. But this theory hasn't been proven yet. The existence of life in Venus's clouds might explain curious anomalies in the composition of the planet's atmosphere. Solar radiation and lightning are supposed to generate tons of carbon monoxide on Venus. But in reality, this gas is rare, as if something is removing it. Another weird thing is the presence of both hydrogen sulfide and sulfur dioxide in the atmosphere. Usually, these two readily react together. That's why it's rare to find them coexisting. The only explanation can be that some process keeps churning them out. But probably the most mysterious is the presence of carbonyl sulfide. The thing is, on Earth, it's only produced by microbes and not by some inorganic process. Some experts believe that microbes might be living in the atmosphere of Venus. The surface of the planet, scorching hot and acidic, isn't very suitable for the development of life. But up in the atmosphere, it's moist and hospitable, with a pressure similar to Earth and pleasant temperatures. But again, we haven't received any solid proof yet. In 2003, scientists discussed the possibility that the traces of sulfur on Jupiter's moon Europa could be the waste products of colonies of underground bacteria. The compounds were first discovered by the Galileo space probe, which also found some evidence of a volcanically warmed ocean beneath the icy crust of the moon. The sulfur signatures look similar to the waste products of bacteria living in the surface ice covering lakes in Antarctica on Earth. But other scientists rejected the idea. They argued that the sulfur could have come from the neighboring moon. I.O. there, it's found in abundance. We could use one of the largest lasers in the world to detect alien spaceships. If aliens existed and managed to make a spacecraft as huge as Jupiter, our equipment could probably detect it using the ripples its warp drives would produce in space-time. You see, an enormous spaceship is bound to produce gravitational waves while moving around. You can read about a warp drive, also called a drive-enabling space warp, in science fiction. This device distorts the shape of the space-time continuum and is one of several ways of traveling through space. It's often described as similar to hyperspace, a faster-than-light method of interstellar travel. A spaceship equipped with a warp drive can travel at speeds greater than the speed of light by many orders of magnitude. But unlike some other fictitious faster-than-light methods of travel, like a jump drive, it doesn't permit immediate transfers between two points. Instead, it involves a measurable passage of time. A spacecraft using a warp drive would still keep interacting with objects in normal space and produce gravitational waves too. That's why if any extraterrestrial gigantic spacecraft traveled through our galaxy, the Laser Interferometer, Gravitational Wave Observatory, LIGO, in the U.S. might be able to detect it. Its equipment could search for the ripples in the fabric of space-time left by the spaceship. The bigger an object is, the larger gravitational waves it would leave. Planets, neutron stars, and even black holes produce quite prominent ripples. For the first time, such space-time ripples were directly detected in 2015. And since then, scientists have been getting better and better at spotting gravitational waves. New calculations published at some time ago suggested that LIGO could look beyond conventional sources of space-time ripples. The authors of the study claimed that colossal alien spacecraft traveling at high speeds or pushed along by warp drives could also produce the telltale vibrations. The LIGO detector notices gravitational waves from the tiniest distortions they make in space-time when passing through it. The observatory consists of two intersecting L-shaped detectors, each with two arms that are almost two and a half miles long. They also have two identical laser beams inside. The experiment is designed in such a way that if a gradational wave passes through our planet, the laser light in one arm of the detector gets compressed while the other expands. It creates a minuscule change in the relative path lengths of the beams arriving at the detector. At the same time, the warpings of space-time that even the largest gravitational waves make are barely noticeable. They're often the size of a few thousandths of a proton or neutron. It means that LIGO is incredibly sensitive and requires precise maintenance and calibration. To check how far this sensitivity can stretch, 
researchers made calculations of the smallest object that would produce clearly detectable gravitational waves on Earth. Apparently, it would still be pretty big. To be detectable by LIGO, an alien spacecraft would need to weigh roughly the same as Jupiter, be within 326,000 light-years away from Earth, and travel at one-tenth the speed of light. Could spaceships of this scale and speed exist? It's unclear. But hopefully, scientists will be able to squeeze down the ship's size to slightly more reasonable proportions thanks to the increasing sensitivity of gravitational wave detectors. For example, in the mid-30s, the European Space Agency's laser interferometer, space antenna, is going to be deployed. Scientists also think that advanced alien warp drives could create a gravitational wave patterns distinguishable from natural sources. If detected, these alien waves could probe at use with answers to how to reverse engineer the technology. All because the shape of the gravitational wave signal is dependent on the trajectory of an object. Once a burst signal is detected, we could attempt to figure out the qualities of the transportation mechanism used there based on the shape of the gravitational wave signal. It's September 1977. You're playing one of the first video game consoles released in North America. You step outside and see the whole neighborhood waiting for Voyager 1 to launch. It's a super sunny day, so you squint a little, trying to see what's happening. You live in the neighborhood right outside the launching station. You get yourself some food and watch the Voyager take off into space. You're so impressed, you decide to dedicate your career to working with NASA. 35 years later, you're now a senior official in NASA, specializing in Voyager 1. It's 2012, and you're sitting in the control room with your colleagues. Everyone is staring at their computer screens as they work on the Voyager. You're sitting on the top, overlooking everything and making sure all systems are in check. This day is special, as Voyager 1 is about to exit the heliosphere, which is a science word for the outer shell of our solar system. It's a bubble of space affected by the solar wind, which comes from the sun. By 2021, it got 14 billion miles away from Earth, which is equivalent to 153 astronomical units from the sun. One astronomical unit is the distance between the sun and the Earth. The craft was originally meant to fly by Uranus, Saturn, and Jupiter, and toss itself from one planet to another with the use of their gravitational pull. Everyone is impatiently waiting for it to exit the heliosphere. Three, two, one, and it's officially out. All systems are normal and functioning. You praise your team for doing an excellent job. With Voyager 1 reaching this far, there's still tons to explore in outer space. You were once a young adult, watching the craft launch outside your neighborhood. And now, you're the main person in charge of the operation. Nine years later. Since Voyager 1 left the heliosphere, you've been checking up on it every now and then, making sure all systems and functions are in order. It's been sending back measurements of the interstellar medium. It's the area between the stars of our galaxy, consisting of ionized materials. Ionized is basically a simple version of a molecule or substance. The interstellar medium is an electrically charged state of plasma, or ionized plasma, and is very unstable. It's like going from lightning in a thunderstorm back to calm rain in a matter of seconds. The plasma up there is different than the plasma on Earth, in that it's difficult to filter out. There are around 0.06 atoms for every cubic inch in the interstellar medium. The air we breathe on Earth has billions of atoms. By measuring the plasma in the interstellar medium, we can further understand the behavior and structure of chemicals and gases. It's possible that the oxygen we know and love on Earth is different than the ones out there. One of your main tasks is to learn more about how the solar wind from the sun and interstellar medium interact with each other to create the heliosphere. So, after doing some routine checkups and other maintenance work on Voyager 1 from the control room, you notice something strange coming from the screen. You sit in front of the computer, crunching the numbers of the plasma vibrations and convert them into an audio file of about 3 kilohertz. You click on it and listen to an eerie, subtle hum. 
You and your team are surprised that these vibrations occurred in such a small frequency. Given that space is massive, something like this might mean life on other planets. Everyone else at the station rushes to the control room to listen to that sound from outer space. It's monotonous and faint, but it's definitely coming from outside the heliosphere. You run the numbers over and over to make sure it's not a fluke, but it's on point. You make sure your team doesn't spill the beans to anyone outside until everything is known and clear. You get into beast mode with work and try to catch the sound again, and it remains. You can't sleep trying to think of something that could be producing this hum. A few days pass by, and the sound is pretty consistent. If there was some life out there trying to communicate with you, then surely it would have said something that can be deciphered. You analyze the audio files once again, trying to see if it's some phonetic language you don't know. You call in a linguist to see if she can make something out of it. You and the squad gather around, waiting impatiently for some answers. After a while, she believes that it might be someone out there communicating with us, but the only way to find out is by sending something back to them. You arrange a meeting with your team and try to figure out what message you can send. After much thinking and lots of coffee, you decide to send them one phrase in English. Who are you? You send out the signal through Voyager 1 and wait for any changes in the hum, but you don't get anything straight away. It may take some time for a response. You wait all night and still there's nothing. It's starting to look like there isn't anything out there. For the next couple of days, you keep sending out phrases for anything to pick up. Since space is a vacuum, sound waves can't travel. So sending out voice messages on a large speaker won't work. You locate the source of the humming and aim for it when sending the audio file. Every day, you send something different, but still, you don't hear anything from them for a week. It seems that intelligent life in the distant world isn't real. The areas between the star systems and a galaxy aren't necessarily a complete vacuum. That's where the interstellar medium is. It contains gases, dust, and cosmic rays, which are energy particles. After many months of this constant humming being produced, you still try to figure out what's going on. You sit there, remembering the time when the Voyager was first launched. You remember running outside after playing some video games. You couldn't see properly because of the sun, and you freeze in your spot and have a eureka moment. You go through some notes taken in the past. The answer was in front of you all this time. Every now and then, the sun sends a burst of energy that causes the plasma of interstellar space to vibrate. Scientists can measure the frequency of waves when the plasma vibrates to show how close they are to each other. And on the day when the hum was delivered, there were some irregular frequencies coming from the sun. So that hum might have been the plasma vibrating in a weird way because of the sun flares. But these low-level vibrations last longer than quick jumps and spikes. They're fainter. You run the tests again and find out that it's not some intelligent life forms out there trying to talk to you. It's the little vibrations caused by sun flares. You notify your team about this breakthrough and everyone's celebrating. But after all these tests and research, you still don't know why plasma mm. in the interstellar medium vibrates in such a way. Those answers will have to wait. 2027. It's been 50 years since the launch of Voyager 1. You're way into your senior years and just retired from NASA. You have many scholarships in your name and programs for young people who want to learn about space and science. You go back to the control room once more, where you thought you had discovered intelligent life on a distant world. Then you remember all the good times you had. You say goodbye to everything, knowing that this is Voyager's final moments. It was built to last up to 50 years. After that, it'll just be a floating object in the vastness of space. It's already surprising to know that this is Earth's most distant object from us, but it's time to let others take your place. You shut off the lights and close the door. The Voyager makes one last beep before eternal silence. One pretty bizarre theory claims that space is water, and we're here to figure out whether it's a legit scientific idea 
or a fallacy resulting from myths and legends. Spoiler alert, you might be in for a surprise. Space is an almost perfect vacuum that has an extremely low density of hydrogen molecules, helium, dust particles, and plasma. As for water, it consists of hydrogen and oxygen. While hydrogen is the most abundant element in the universe, as well as the main material for the formation of stars, oxygen in space is mainly formed by the fusion of helium and carbon nuclei. It happens during the nuclear fusion process of stars that can be at different stages of their evolution. No wonder that there's much less oxygen than hydrogen in the universe, but it's still enough to form water in different states. For example, water molecules can be found on dust particles in molecular clouds, cold and dense regions of outer space. They are also present in interstellar space. There, they take the form of gas or ice on the surface of comets, asteroids, planets, and moons. The surface of some satellites of Saturn and Jupiter are covered with ice crust under which there's probably liquid water. Venus and Mars have gaseous and liquid water in their atmospheres. On our home planet, water covers more than 70% of its surface. In other words, space is filled with water, but it's distributed extremely unevenly. Interestingly, people started to compare space to water long before they found out what the cosmos was actually made of. The very theory that space is water dates back to the times before the current era. For example, some ancient civilizations believed that the ocean was a portal to space. Of course, in the physical sense, there's no direct connection between these two. But both represent a huge space with different mysterious inhabitants which people have been trying to study for a long, long time. People in the past believed that the ocean and stars were linked. Thousands of years have passed. People have mastered sea navigation, but we still haven't solved all the mysteries of the deep sea. Just like we don't know all that much about space, what giant monsters can be hiding in its depths? Only 2-5% to of the world ocean has been explored, and space has been explored by the same percentage. For example, dark matter, making up most of the universe, is still a mystery to us. Of course, in a physical sense, space doesn't behave like water. But both water and space are fatal. Without a special suit and equipment, you won't be able to breathe, and there's also decompression sickness threatening your life. Only in space, it's a lack of pressure, while in the depths of the ocean, it's either too much pressure or a dramatic pressure drop due to the fast rise from the depth to the surface. Even if outer space is not water, could it be liquid? One study suggested that the vacuum of outer space could be a dilatant fluid, also called shear thickening fluid. This theory is based on the so-called Pioneer Anomaly, a decades-old astrophysical mystery involving two NASA space probes. In the 1970s, two NASA spacecraft Pioneer 10 and Pioneer 11 started their journey toward Jupiter and Saturn. Observing their trajectory, scientists from NASA noticed that the probes started to slow down. Of course, the scientific community began to offer different hypotheses. One of them suggested that thermal radiation emitted by the probes in space could have created some pressure on their surface. It could be slowing down their movement. Eventually, after additional research, it was concluded that the physical vacuum most likely behaved like a dilatant fluid when the shear stress increased. Later, another scientist managed to find some proof that space-time can behave like a fluid. You see, according to Einstein's theory of relativity, space-time curves around mass and energy. That's what leads to an effect we know as gravity. But apparently, if you write down the equations of sound waves moving in liquid, they will look the same as the equations of waves traveling in a gravitational field. Such a mathematical relationship between fluids and gravity is called analog gravity. The researcher also managed to recreate these gravitational analogies in a lab. At the moment, the results of these experiments are still controversial, and many scientists don't support this theory. Even so, maybe the idea that outer space is liquid isn't so unfounded? Life originated in water, or so we always heard. In reality, it could have begun in ice. We know that it all started more than 3 billion years ago with simple microbes, and it's been evolving ever since. However, there are many theories about how exactly it happened. Maybe not heat, but cold was the beginning of everything. Cells were the first tiny life forms. 
But before we had fully developed cells, there were simpler things that couldn't survive on their own. Certain important chemicals for life, like the mentioned amino acids, usually float in water in tiny amounts. First, they needed something to help them stay together without spreading all over the place. Otherwise, they would have gotten lost in the sea. And second, they needed to stick together in groups to form more complex things. Moreover, when they started to form in groups, they started the process of evolution. They chose the best molecules to do specific tasks and kicked out the faulty ones. Without this organization, the fastest replicators or parasites would have taken over. There were several ways they could organize themselves. Three billion years ago, oceans were covered in ice. And it turned out that certain important chemicals for life, such as amino acids and nucleic acids, are more stable in colder temperatures. When water freezes, these chemicals that hang out in the oceans get packed together, making it easier for life to form. Or maybe what helped them were special spots called hydrothermal vents. Imagine the deepest, darkest parts of the ocean floor, where hot water shoots out from cracks in the Earth's crust. Life might have started right there, in these extreme conditions. These vents spew out important elements like carbon and hydrogen, which are crucial for life. As the superheated water travels through the Earth's crust, it picks up other important stuff like minerals. When it finally bursts out of the vents, it creates a kind of soup rich in chemicals. In the rocky crevices around these vents, all these molecules could have come together and sparked the first signs of life. The hot, mineral-rich environment acted like a kitchen to cook the first recipes ever for living things. Even today, these vents are home to vibrant ecosystems, showing that life can thrive in extreme conditions. Ancient stories also talk about life starting from clay. It turns out that this idea has a scientific basis too. Imagine tiny particles of clay, like little grains of sand, sticking together in a structured way. As they grow and get bigger, they keep their original shape intact. They form bigger areas and clumps. They become kind of like patches, clay clumps with tiny holes inside. Each patch may be exposed to different things in the environment, like different chemicals or substances. When these outside molecules go through the clay, they get trapped along the way. Once trapped, these molecules get organized in specific patterns within the clay. This process is compared to how our genes organize things. Just like genes tell our bodies how to arrange different parts, the clay patches organize molecules. This theory was created back in the 80s, although it was very controversial at the time. We need more investigation to figure out whether this is true or not. Ancient people could have been onto something when they said that we all started with Zeus's lightning. Life itself is a chemical reaction, and it needs energy. Without energy, nothing happens. Cells are the building blocks of life. You can picture these cells as tiny factories bustling with activity, constantly working to keep you alive. Just like every factory needs a power source to keep its machines running smoothly, they need energy to do their job. In the world of cells, that power source is something called ATP, which stands for adenosine triphosphate. It's an organic molecule. There are also some backup generators with fancy names like theoesters, acyl phosphates, and reduced ferrodoxin. They basically work like extra boosts. When life first started, it needed energy to make complex stuff like proteins and DNA. Back then, this energy came from the environment. It could be light, heat, chemicals, or even lightning. That lightning might have kick-started life. Back in the 1950s, scientists did something called the Miller-Urey experiment. They zapped a mix of gases that mimicked Earth's early atmosphere with electric sparks. Suddenly, that caused amino acids and sugars, the basic stuff of life, to pop out. 
all living things share a special code called DNA, the genetic code. It's one of the oldest and most important things about life. And we think this code existed in the very first forms of life too. This code is quite tricky. It involves putting the right building blocks, amino acids, together in the right order. And there are special molecules called tRNA and mRNA that help with this process. The early version of this code was probably simpler than what we have now. It might have used shorter instructions like using just two letters instead of three. Scientists are still figuring out how DNA first appeared at all. Some think it might have started alongside metabolism, where certain molecules helped put the right building blocks together. Now, they think that the secret to understanding how DNA and proteins are formed lies in looking at RNA. RNA is a versatile player, a molecule that can do some of the jobs of both DNA and proteins. In the past, it could have been the star before DNA and proteins took over. And even though they're the main players now, RNA still has important roles in living things. For example, it can switch genes on and off, controlling how cells behave. But then comes the next question. How did RNA come to be? Well, we need to look for even simpler origins. RNA are big and complicated molecules, but life could have begun with smaller ones bumping into each other and starting chemical reactions. These reactions might have happened inside tiny capsules that acted like cell membranes. Over time, they might have evolved into more complex ones that could do the job better. In other words, life could have started with a basic recipe and slowly added more ingredients. Every living thing is made of carbon. Carbon is an essential life block. It's the stuff that makes molecules. And they form cells, tissues, and organs. Earth was very different many years ago. There were no plants or trees, and the air was different too. Instead of the oxygen we breathe now, there were gases like hydrogen, nitrogen, hydrogen sulfide, and of course, carbon dioxide which contained carbon. In this ancient world, life might have started in a way where organisms didn't eat other organisms for energy. Perhaps they made their own food from these simple chemicals. They could eat this carbon dioxide, kind of like plants do today, and this is where they receive their carbon from. We call this autotrophic origin. They think that certain metals like iron and nickel, along with minerals containing them, played a big role in this process. These metals and minerals acted like assistants, helping chemical reactions happen that were important for life to begin. They were found all over the Earth back then, especially in places where there wasn't much oxygen. And finally, we have a wild theory that life didn't start on Earth at all. It could have been brought to us from somewhere else. Rocks from Mars sometimes get blasted into space by big cosmic collisions. Some of these rocks have ended up on Earth, carrying tiny microbes with them. So maybe, while we search for life on Mars, it could have been the red planet that started our very own life. Or maybe it wasn't Mars. Others suggest that life might have hitched a ride on comets from other star systems, traveling through space until they landed here. But if life did come from somewhere else, it just raises more questions. For example, how did life start in space in the first place? This is why scientists are a bit skeptical about this idea, which is called panspermia. In any case, the origins of life are a huge mystery, and we'll need decades of research to figure out the full answer. The very first known interstellar object, or ISO, to pay a visit to our solar system was a rocky, elongated interloper with a slightly reddish hue. It was spotted in 2017 and was dubbed with the Hawaiian name Aumuamua. It was almost 10 times as long as it was wide, and it was extremely unusual. 
Objects in our solar system are rarely shaped this way. So astronomers hoped it could provide some clues into how other star systems form and function. For hundreds of millions of years, longer than I've been around, this bizarre guest has been wandering through our home Milky Way galaxy, not bothering to settle down in some star system. And then, it came across the solar system. After the space traveler was discovered, hundreds and probably even thousands of telescopes all over the world, including ESO's Very Large Telescope in Chile, sprang into action. They started measuring the object's orbit, its color, and brightness. That's when it became apparent that the space rock had an unusual orbit. Some astronomers suggested that Aumuamua was emitting hydrogen it had picked up during its journey between stars. This was a simple explanation for the mystery that had evoked lots of outlandish theories. When this bizarre guest was first spotted upon entering the solar system, scientists were not sure what its nature was. Some claimed it was a comet. Others disagreed, saying it didn't have the features typical for comets – a visible long tail and a coma, which is a cloud of gases surrounding the nucleus of a comet. Plus, its shape was different from that of other comets. The only thing that made Aumuamua more comet-like was the way it accelerated as it went away from the Sun. The unusual object started to slow down on its way out, but in a strange way, as if not only gravity was in play there. It seemed like something was creating a force to counter this gravity. But unfortunately, this theory didn't quite fit either. The problem is that comets usually have large quantities of water ice on their surface. And as the sun heats this ice, it gets ejected as jets of gas. Those jets act as mini rocket boosters. But Oumuamua not only had no tail whatsoever, but it was also too small to capture enough solar energy to support this kind of activity. Of course, this mysterious space visitor caused some more outlandish theories. For example, some people started to claim that Oumuamua could be a spacecraft sent by a civilization living in another star system. However, scientists found a better explanation. A comet that is traveling between stars gets cooked by cosmic radiation. These rays penetrate thick layers of ice, converting up to 25% of water molecules into molecules of hydrogen. And then, this trapped hydrogen gets released when some star warms the comet. The effects of this process are almost invisible. This might be the reason why we didn't see a spectacular tail accompanying Oumuamua. At the same time, the potential comet was so small that this could produce enough force to power its acceleration. As for the amount of ice released as Oumuamua was coming closer to the Sun, it was likely too small for astronomers to spot it. Now, even though Oumuamua was the first known interstellar object to enter our solar system, it wasn't the last. In August 2019, Comet 2I Borisov visited us, becoming the second ISO astronomers managed to spot. Now, no one can argue that there are simply must be more visitors from faraway star systems than those two. ISOs are rare. But our solar system is pretty old. It must have been capturing some interstellar travelers over the millions and millions of years of its existence, even though they never stayed for very long. One study has taken a closer look at interstellar objects, and they concluded that these space travelers might be caught not in solar orbits, but in near-Earth orbits. The astronomers working on this project even go as far as to claim that there might be a lot of ISOs in orbit around Earth. Now, finding tiny objects in the vastness of the cosmos is extremely tricky. Think about it. What images of distant areas of space do we usually get? Mostly stars. Sometimes unclear pictures of exoplanets. Even more rarely, it can be disks of debris. But fine detail in small space objects? Almost never. So it's actually lucky for us that other solar systems send their inhabitants to visit us. Because by studying ISOs, we gain insight into the formation, evolution, and functioning of other star systems. Have you ever heard of the Oort Cloud? It's the most distant region of our solar system, and it's quite unusual. You see, the orbits of the planets lie mostly in the same flat disk surrounding the Sun. But the Oort cloud is believed to resemble a spherical shell surrounding the entire solar system. 
It looks like a gigantic, thick-walled bubble made up of chunks of ice and other space debris as large as mountains or even bigger. Astronomers think that the Oort cloud contains billions, if not trillions, of different objects. There might also be a connection between the Oort cloud and ISOs. Because scientists think that interstellar objects might outnumber those from the solar system in this region, even though no one has ever observed the Oort cloud directly, astronomers are sure it does exist. They made such a conclusion after observing the distribution of comets in our solar system. The Oort cloud could have formed from debris in the early solar system. But some experts argue that the largest part of this unusual shell could be interstellar in origin. If travelers from other star systems are as common as some studies suggest, lots of the bodies on the edges of the solar system are likely to have originated in other systems. Sadly, this theory hasn't been proven yet. Now, since we've been talking about comets, not Cupid or Donder or Blitzen, one of them has recently approached the Sun at breakneck speed. It was 96P Machols 1. This comet is around 3.7 miles wide, and astronomers think it might have arrived from outside the solar system. The NASA European Space Agency Solar and Heliospheric Observatory spacecraft has been monitoring the comet. So look at this. That's the comet's tail. It's mostly made up of gas. It's trickling behind frozen chunks of ice that are getting heated by the radiation coming from the sun. In some cases, a comet can have two tails, one made of dust and the other consisting of gas. And each of them can reach hundreds and, in some extreme situations, even millions of miles in length. In 2008, scientists analyzed the material left by 150 comets. They found out that the comet we're talking about was quite low in carbon and didn't contain a large enough amount of some other typical materials. This could only mean one thing. The comet was an interloper coming from another star system. It may have been ejected from its original solar system by the gravity of a large planet. After that, the poor homeless thing probably spent a large amount of time wandering around space. Until it came across Jupiter. The gas giant could have bent the comet's trajectory, trapping it in orbit around the Sun. There's one more theory. According to it, the comet formed in a poorly studied region of the solar system. And it has this weird composition due to its repeated journeys around the Sun. Now, scientists are watching the comet with anticipation, like Christmas. Since it's an atypical one, both in its behavior and composition, they don't know what they will see, which makes the whole process even more exciting. Most comets falling toward the Sun are quite small, not more than 32 feet across. That's why they burn up as soon as they come close to our star. But the sheer size of Machols 1, which is more than two-thirds the height of Mount Everest, seems to protect the comet from evaporating completely. <laughs>